So our topic is cephalosporins. So we'll be talking about first generation, second generation, third, fourth, and fifth generation cephalosporin. There are five generations. We will be covering all all five generations. At the end of this lecture, you should have very good knowledge about cephalosporins and their antibacterial spectrum. So listen carefully and take the maximum out of this lecture. When you talk about the cephalosporin structure. They are basic structure. They have a cephalom nucleus, seven amino cephalosporinic acid nucleus. That is the cephalom nucleus. This is the basic structure of all cephalosporins. You can see it has a six-membered dihydrothiazine ring. Remember, uh, penicillin has the five-membered thiazolidine ring, but this this has the six-membered uh, dihydrothiazine ring, six-membered dihydrothiazine ring, right? And then to to uh, next to that is the Beta lactam ring, four member beta lactam ring. Then there is a side chain, R1 side chain attached to the carbon 7. So this is the important side chain. And there is another side chain attached to the carbon 3, this one, carbon 3, R2 side chain. So R1 side chain is very important. Mo any modification in the R1 side chain result in change in the antibacterial spectrum. So if we want to increase the gram negative coverage or increase the gram positive coverage and add anti pseudomonal activity, you modify the R1 side chain, R1 side chain. You modify the R1 side chain. And if you want to change the pharmacology properties, you modify the R2 side chain, which is which is attached to the carbon tree. Such as if you want to um, if you want to enhance the penetration of the medication to the subarachnoid sub space to achieve good CSF concentration, right? Such as treating meningeal mening 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 meningeal infections, right? Then you need to modify side chain attached to the carbon tree, R2 side chain. So chain modification to the R1 attached to the carbon 7 result in change in the antimicrobial antibacterial spectrum, change in the modification of R2 attached to the carbon tree result in change in the pharmacological properties. So when we talk about the structures, so this is the same thing that we talk about. So there are various substitution as C3, R2, carbon 7 is R1. So they, they lead to different cephalosporin compounds. So modification of the R1 causes changes in the spectrum of antimicrobial activity, as we talk. Modification R2 causes alteration in the pharmacological parameters, such as penetrating into various compartments, such as CNS, or even changing in half-life, elimination half-life. Right, and if you want to enhance the oral absorption, right, you add the amino benzyl group to R1 side chain, right, oral absorption to enhance the oral absorption, you add the amino benzyl group to the R1 side chain. So that is a, uh, you know, actually that is changing the uh, pharmacological parameter, but it is on the R1 side chain. Then, if you add the methoxy group to the R1. That is where the, uh, if you add the methoxy group, right? Methoxy group to the uh, first the R1 side chain that is attached to carbon seven. It results in the development of cephalomycines. Cephalomycines are group of cephalosporins that comes under second generation cephalos under second generation cephalosporins. They include so cephalomycines are second generation. The second generation cephalosporin, they include cephocytine, cephotitan, and cephmetasol. These second generation cephalosporins are very important because they are unlike other second generation cephalosporins, and like unlike most other cephalosporins, they have very good anaerobic activity. They have very good anaerobic activity. They are less, they have less activity for gram positives, but they have good gram negative coverage plus good anaerobic activity because they have less gram positive activity because they are binding to penicillin binding proteins of the gram positive organism means poor that is why they have less gram positive activity but they have good gram negative activity most importantly anaerobic coverage so they are the cephocytin cephotitan cephametrazole right they come under cephamycines they are actually they are within the uh, second generation of cephalosporin antibiotics Right. So that uh, I already mentioned about modification of R1 produce different generation of cephalosporins. Right. Then you will be learning about ceftalosine and ceftacidim. They actually they have they have very good activity against pseudomonas. Right. Ceft more than ceftacidim, uh, 
cephalosporin has very good anti-seed monal activity. It's a fifth generation cephalosporin. Cephalosporin is a fifth generation cephalosporin. Ceftacidim is a third generation cephalosporin. That we will be talking in detail, right? So remember, these anti-seed monal cephalosporins are very important. No, right? Any any medication that have anti-seed monal activity, remember those things. Those are very important uh, areas in microbiology and infectious diseases, right? Ceftalosine is very very effective more than ceftacidim against uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Then also by addition of a uridyl group to the R1 side chain such as cefepirazone, right? It increases the anti pseudomonal activity. If you remember uridyl penicillins, if you remember my penicillin lecture, right? That we finished about few days ago. Penicillin under penicillins I mentioned about uh, uridyl penicillins. Under that we talk about. Uh, piperacillin. It piperacillin has very good an uh, anti pseudomonal activity. Very good anti pseudomonal. So cefepirazone also have uridyl group. So remember the uridyl group is actually associated with good anti pseudomonal activity. Good anti pseudomonal activity. Uridyl group. Right. So cefepirazone has anti pseudomonal activity. Then moxalactam. Moxalactam has carboxyl group attached to the R1 side chain. If you remember carbon carbopenicillin, when I talk about penicillins, I mentioned about carboxyl penicillin. There is a carboxyl group attached to the side chain of that penicillin that also enhances the anti pseudomonal activity. The example was tricacillin, right? But here carboxyl group attached to the R1 side chain result in formation of moxalactam. So they also have anti pseudomonal activity. So the point is uridyl group, addition of uridyl group resulting anti pseudomonal activity, addition of a carboxyl group resulting anti pseudomonal activity. That is why cefepirazone and moxalactam, which are cephalosporins, have anti pseudomonal activity. Then also we will be talking about fifth generation cephalosporin, which are new cephalosporins. So we have modified C3 side chain, we have modified C7 side chain. By modifying C3 and C7, we have created fifth generation cephalosporin that have activity against methicillin resistant isophoriosomasa. Remember, we, we can't use so far, there are no any beta lactam that are effective against MRSA, methicillin resistant isophorias. But fifth generation cephalosporins are effective against methicillin resistant isophorias. Why? Because we modify CT and C7 so that they have anti pseudomonal activity. Remember, MRSA activity, uh, methicillin resistant isophorias is they change the penicillin binding protein. They change the penicillin binding protein to penicillin binding protein 2A. Penicillin binding protein 2A. I mentioned here, yeah. Penicillin binding protein 2A. Right? So that is that because they get a new gene, MACK gene, right? They get a new gene, MACK gene. By this MACK gene result in formation of PBP 2A that no beta lactam can bind. That's why they are methicillin resistant stuff for years. But uh, fifth generation cephalosporin can bind to this PBP 2A. So they can be effective against methicillin resistant stuff for years. So now we'll talk about the gener five generations of cephalosporin one by one, right? First generation. What are the examples under first generation? I, I mentioned only the important ones, okay? Just remember cephalosporin, cephalotin, cephadroxyl, cephalexine. So those are the important first generation cephalosporins. Remember first generation cephalosporins, they have very good, very good gram-positive activity. So they may have little gram-negative activity, but we don't expect good gram-negative coverage for them. Why? Because we don't use them for gram-negative infections. So we expect them to have good gram-positive coverage. So their gram-negative coverage is negligent, right? So these, uh, so they are, effect they are effective against gra effective against gram-positives, especially staphylococci and streptococci. So they are effective against streptococci, including streptococcus pyogenes, group A, group B, Right, they are very effective. Then also, they are also effective against effective against Staphylococcus aureus, including penicillinase producing. Right, penicillinase producing Staphylococcus Right, they are cephalosporin are effective. Penicillinase cannot destroy this first generation cephalosporin. Right, like penicillins. Right, they are inactivated by pen, uh, penicillinase. Right, but these cephalosporins, they are resistant. Right. Because penicillin side effect, they cannot, uh, the first generation cephalosporin cannot be inactivated by penicillinase produced by Staphorius. 
right? But remember, methicillin resistant aphorias are not effective. I mean, these antibiotics, first generation are not effective against methicillin resistant staphorias. Okay, methicillin resistant staphorias. That is only fifth generation, right? That's what we talked. We'll talk a little more in detail a little later. Then second generation cephalosporins. They are important ones. Remember cefuroxin, ceproxyl, and also remember cefamycin. Remember that uh, cefamycin methoxy group attached to the uh, R1 side chain, right? So the examples are cefamycin and cefocetine, cefotitan, cefametrosol. They have good uh, negative activity, including anaerobic activity. And so, so, so all, all second generations, right? They have good gram-positive coverage. Like, like first generation, they have good gram-positive coverage. And also they have gram-negative coverage. The 50-50, right? Remember first generation, only gram-positive, they have reasonable gram positive, reasonable gram negative coverage. So they are second generation, so effective stuff against stuff aureus, effective against streptococcus pathogens, including other streptococci, right? And also they have reasonable gram negative coverage, right? In addition, cephamycin has very good anaerobic coverage, including bacterial fragilis, right? Anaerobic coverage. So that is about the second generation cephalosporins, right? Second generation cephalosporins. Then we'll go to third generation, fourth generation, and fifth generation cephalosporins. Third generation cephalosporins. Third generation cephalosporins include cefotoxin, ceftrioxone, ceftacidim, cefixim, cefditorin, ceftrodoxim, and cefdinir. Ceftrodoxim and cefdinir. Right. So they are inactivated by these beta lactamases that I have mentioned. They are broad spectrum beta lactamases. MC beta lactamases, they are inactivated. These third generation cephalosporins are not resistant, so they will be inactivated. Extended spectrum beta lactamases produced by organisms such as uh, Acinotobacter and um, Klebsiella pneumonia, ex extended dyspectrum beta lactamases. And also carbapenemases. Carbapenemases are very resistant beta lactamases, the strongest beta lactamases. They are also produced by Klebsiella pneumonia and uh, Acinotobacter baumana, which are hospital pathogens actually. They are hospital pathogens, very resistant organisms, right? Acinotobacter. So these are inactivated by these beta lactamases. Remember, these are broad dyspectrum beta lactamases, right? So when you talk about third generation cephalosporin, they have good gram positive coverage. I mean, they have very good gram negative coverage. They have very good gram negative coverage. And some of them have good gram positive coverage. Good, some of them, not everything, every, not everybody. And ceftroxim, uh, ceftrioxone, ceftinir, right? They have uh, cefpodoxim, ceftitorin, they have cefixim, they have good gram positive coverage. And they have very good gram negative coverage, right? And, uh, but they are the antibiotics such as ceftacidim, they don't have gram positive, they have very minimal gram positive coverage and they are mainly, uh, ceftacidim is mainly reserved for anti-pseudomonal activity as a anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin, ceftacidim, right? Ceftacidim is mainly reserved as for pseudomonas originosa. So otherwise, all the other cephalo third generation cephalosporins have good gram positive coverage and very good gram negative coverage and some of them have uh, anti-pseudomonal activity, ceftacidim have anti-pseudomonal activity, right? So when you talk about ceftrioxone, ceftrioxone has high protein binding. Ceftrioxone have high protein binding. So that is why ceftrioxone has very long half-life in the blood because it binds to protein and remain in blood for a long period. That is why you, if, if you give ceftrioxone to a patient, you give once a day, once a day. It's just once a day, single dose, QD, once a day. Right, once a day because they have long half life. That is, if you want to discharge a patient on a cephalos third generation, third generation cephalosporin, use ceftrioxone, right? Because the, you don't have to keep the patient in the hospital, right? Only thing you will have to arrange a nurse to go to the patient house and give the injection daily, rather so the patient doesn't have to pay for whole day, right? He will have to pay only for the nurse, so that will be cheaper for the patient, right? So ceftrioxone, so they have long half life. It's a once a day dosing. Right, I mean, if you remember, the, the best drug for Neisseria gonorrhea, ceftriaxone, single dose, 250 milligram, intramuscular. But ceftriaxone can be given intravenous, intramuscular. Right, Ceft ceftriaxone, 
Cefatoxin doesn't bind to proteins. Right? So it has short as half life. You have to give it every eight hours or six hours, sometimes every four hours. Right? Then also some the fourth generation, third generation cephalosporins are uh, orally. They, they are available or as oral drugs also. Cefdinib, Cefpodoxin, Cefditorin, Cefixime. They are also available for oral use. Right? Remember these third generation cephalosporins are very important cephalosporins because they are uh, they have broad spectrum, right? If you remember, gram positive coverage, gram negative coverage, and some of them have anti pseudomonal coverage, so they are very good uh, antibiotics. Then fourth generation. Fourth generation cephalosporins include cefipime and cefpyrome. Cefipim and cefpyrome. Right. It has the widest microbial coverage out of all five generations. You will understand it has very good gram positive coverage. It's tough it's step coverage is very good. Good gram negative coverage. Covers very good gram and very good anti pseudomonal coverage. Right. They are gram negative so pseudomonal, but remember we have to pseudomonal infections are very common in hospitals. So you need to know what are the antibiotics effective against pseudomonas originosa. So that's how you always when we teach, we always cover anti pseudomonal antibiotics, right? So, gram positive coverage, gram negative coverage, anti pseudomonal activity, right? So, third generation and fourth generation cephalosporin, we call them extended spectrum cephalosporin because of their spectrum, right? Good gram positive, gram negative, and most of the most of them also covers some of them actually covers uh, pseudomonas originosa, right? So, cefepime and cefpyron, they both have anti pseudomonal activity. So, that is fourth generation cephalosporin. Then fifth generation cephalosporins. Fifth generation cephalosporins, there are three as of now, ceftaroline, ceftabiprol, and ceftaloxane. Ceftaroline, cefta, uh, ceftabiprol, ceftaloxane. So remember I told that they have MRC active because, right, they can bind to penicillin binding two way. Penicillin binding two way, right, encoded by the MACK gene of the MR machine resistor for years. MACK gene, right? So that's why they are effective against um, methicillin resistance to stuff for years, right? They also have other gram positive coverage, right? Streptococci, streptococci pneumonia, and ampicillin susceptible enterococcus faecalis, right? So they have they have good gram negative coverage, right? Good gram negative coverage and including uh, like similar to third, good gram negative coverage similar to third generation cephalosporins. They have good gram negative coverage. They also ceftobiprol and ceftaloxane also have very good. Um, anti pseudomonal coverage. Ceftaloxane is very powerful. Ceftaloxane is very powerful. It is, is uh, MIC is 4 to 16 fold lower than ceftacidine. The minimal inhibit, inhibitory concentration needed to inhibit the minimal inhibitory concentration of ceftacidine means not the minimal inhibitory concentration of ceftaloxane is 4 to 16 fold lower than ceftacidine. That means they kill at a lower concentration of the drug. That means ceftaloxane is very potent against, very potent compared to ceftacidine. That's why I put here. Ceftaloxane has enhanced activity against pseudomonas originosa. Uh, minimal inhibitory concentration of ceftaloxane against pseudomonas originosa is 4 to 16 fold lower than ceftacidine. Right? Ceftaloxane is available combined with tasobactam also, right? So ceftaloxane is available combined with tasobactam so that tasobactam is a beta lactamase inhibitor so that it will, the ceftaloxane and tasobactam combination will be very effective against beta lactamase producing organisms, including beta lactamase producing pseudomonas originosa, right? Remember, ceftaloxane also has anti pseudomonal activity, but ceftaloxane is very powerful against pseudomonas originosa. Much, much more powerful than pseudomonas uh, ceftacidine that we talked, right? So when we talk about the cephalosporins, so remember cephalosporins are bactericidal antibiotics like other beta lactams, right? So they are maximal bacteria killing occurs four times the MIC. Right? If the bacteria, uh, the, uh, the serum concentration is four times the minimal inhibition concentration, the bacteri bactericidal effect is maximum. Maximum bactericidal effect is there, right? They also have post-antibiotic effect. 
you must be wondering what is post antibiotic post antibiotic effect is the effect of the antibiotic persists even after the antibiotic has been cleared from the blood there is no antibiotic in the blood but the antibiotic effect the bactericidal effect continues that is post antibiotic effect the, uh, the cephalosporins have post antibiotic effect actually it has post antibiotic effect only against gram positive bacteria they are the, the post antibiotic effect gram negative bacteria is very very minimal or very almost absent right so they have post antibiotic effect against gram positive bacteria that means even in the absence of antibody you know the when you give the antibiotic the anti gradually antibiotic will be cleared from the circulation at a, after a certain time there is no antibiotic in the blood but the antibacterial effect continues for some time that's the week, that's the duration that is the that's what we call as post antibiotic effect there are some an antibiotic that type post antibiotic effect like fluoroquinolones we'll be talking when you talk about fluoroquinolones right they know so always remember anti pseudomonas cephalosporin right ceftacidine third generation ceftralosin fifth generation cefepirosin third generation cefepime fourth generation cefpirom fourth generation ceftobrifol uh, fifth generation so we have two fifth generations one third generation two fourth generation right two fourth generation cefepime cefpirom fourth ceftacidine ceftacidine third Ceftobiprol, ceftralosin, uh, fifth generation. Cefepirosin also, third generation, right? Remember, cephalosporin have no activity against chlamydia mycoplasma. Can you just think why chlamydia mycoplasma has cephalosporin has no activity? Because they have chlamydia have very they, there is very small amount of peptidoglycan. Mycoplasma they lack peptidoglycan. Remember, cephalosporins act on the bind to the penicillin binding protein which is transpeptidase and inhibit the penicillin no, beta lactam no, uh, peptidoglycan cross, cross linking they inhibit the peptidoglycan cross linking right they inhibit the peptidoglycan cross linking so cephalosporins have no activity against chlamydia mycoplasma listeria monocytogen listeria is they are gram positive right so they have peptidoglycan but they are uh, the listeria are intrins intrinsically resistant they are they are intrinsically resistant there is no activity at all right so though they are gram positive cephalosporins have no activity against listeria monocytogens so remember that that is a very important point that they test in the board exams actually listeria have no activity okay. no cephalosporins have no activity against listeria because they are intrinsically resistant So remember, cephalosporin penetrating into the cells is very poor. Into the cell, they don't penetrate well. So that is why they are not effective against intracellular pathogens such as Legionella, right? Legionella pneumophila infection, right? They are intracellular pathogens, so they are not effective because they, the 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 penetration of cephalosporin into the cells is very poor. Then CSA penetration by the first and second generation cephalosporins is poor. That's why we don't use first generation, second generation cephalosporins against meningeal mening 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 infections because their CSA penetration is poor. Actually, parenteral cephalosporin, parenteral pen cefuroxim, sorry, parenteral cefuroxim is somewhat effective second generation cephalosporin, but uh, you don't rely on anti uh, meningeal eff effect on. Uh, from the second generation cephalosporin so you have to use parenteral third or fourth generation cephalosporin they they have good csa penetration third and fourth generation cephalosporin then also the uh, cephalosporins are excreted mainly by the glomerular filtration and tubular secretion so they are mainly excreted to the kidney right remember they look at this one glomerular filtration they are mainly glomerular filtration then there is some tubular secretion also like penicillin so that we talked the other day right so tubular secretion is Blocked by probenecid, probenecid. So when the, if you want to increase the serum concentration, use probenecid. It will inhibit the it will block the tubular secretion. Those there is some cephalosporin retained. Only the glomerular filtration works. Does that make sense? Right. So that is the important thing to remember. So, so if you use cephalosporin combined with probenecid, you can increase the half life of cephalosporin. There it results in increased serum concentration of cephalosporins. Next, we'll talk about, talk about side effects, right? So when we talk about side effects, hypersensitive reactions are the most common, right? But when you talk about side effects, they are less than that of 
penicillins, right? Common side hypersensitive reactions include rash and eosinophilia. The, 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 the hypersensitive type 3, which is serum sickness, right? Antigen antibody com, uh, depo, uh, immune complex deposition, that is serum sickness. Anaphylaxis, that is IgE mediated response reactions are very rare with cephalosporins. But remember this one, there can be cross reactivity with other beta lactams. There can be cross. So if there is a beta lactam that has resulted in anaphylactic response to in the past, if the patient who, who comes to you to for treatment had has had an anaphylactic response to a beta lactam in the past, right? Anaphylactic response is, response is IgE mediated response, right? So you can't use cephalosporin because that is dangerous. If the patient had the history of anaphylactic response to a pre, beta lactam in the past, don't use cephalosporins at this time, right? They can, they can be cross reactivity. But if the patient has a uh, hypersensitive response, it is not a non-IgE mediated hypersensitive response, right? No problem. You can use cephalosporins, right? But remember, if the if only the patient has an anaphylactic response, which is IgE mediated response, you don't use cephalosporins. Otherwise, non-IgE mediated hypersensitive response, no problem. You can you are safe. You can safely use uh, cephalosporins. So the, that is about the side effect. Then also other side effect is super infection with candida, right? Right. When you use cephalosporin, they kill the normal flora, and then the candida and becomes will overgrow, right? That is common in the gastrointestinal tract, especially the oral, oral candida, oropharyngeal candidiasis, trust, oral trust, right? T H U R S R S oral trust. Or a trust, right? And also vagina candidiasis. That's another one because they kill the normal flora. Okay. Then no other side effects is pseudomembranous colitis. Pseudomembranous colitis that is uh, 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 closely identified, right? They kill the normal flora and closely identified overgrowth. Closely identified overgrowth, right? Producing toxin that results in pseudomembranous colitis. Then also about the new cephalosporins in clinical trials, right? So there are some new cephalosporins in uh, under clinical trials. So the cedarfor cephalosporin, cedarfor. So that means cephalosporins attached to iron molecule, right? The, the, the best example is cefidorocol, cefidorocol, right? They are cephalosporins attached with attached to iron atoms, right? So the, uh, what what happened here is. Bacteria, bacteria wants to get iron, right? Because it is an essential growth factor. Iron is an essential growth factor, right? Iron is an essential growth factor, right? So uh, when you give cephalosporins attached to this iron, bacteria take the iron with the cephalosporins enter, and cephalos once they enter the bacterial cell, they become effective, right? They will try to have the uh, initiate the bactericidal effect. So that's how they work. So we, because of the iron. So bacteria will willingly take the uh, the iron in into the in, into the cytoplasm, but with that attached cephalosporin also goes in, right? So that is why that is how cefidorocol works, right? So that is a uh, that's a new cephalosporin. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and see you in the next lecture. Thank you. If you found this video helpful, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. You can get new video notifications by clicking the bell icon. My Patreon supporters can request lectures and get exclusive content. Please check the description for links and more details. Thank you.